Uh, okay. Do you want to introduce me or um, should I, I'll introduce myself. Well, I think it's a best way to, to, to start. Professor Taparovsky from, uh, from London, United Kingdom. Okay. Um, yes, I'm uh, from uh, the uh, SOAS uh, University of London. I'm Jan Toporovsky. Uh, I uh, uh, have worked for a long time on the history of economic thought, and in particular, I guess my two uh, main uh, published works are uh, two volumes of intellectual biography of um, uh, one of the great Polish economists of the 20th century, uh, Michał Kalecki. I'm now uh, working on uh, a, bi a, a biography of uh, the, the other great 20th century Polish economist, um, Oskar Lange. Uh, Oskar Lange, can you, uh, shall I, yes, let me put my slides on. Um, here we are. Okay, so can you see all the slides? Yeah. Um, okay, this, uh, so I'm going to, today I'll be talking about uh, Oscar Lange's uh, view of Russian economic management. Okay, dear friends. Okay, I'm with you. I know. century Polish economist um, Oskar Lange. Uh, Oskar Lange, can you, uh, shall I, yes, let me put my slides on. Uh, here we are. Okay, so can you see all the slides? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, this uh, so I'm going to, today I'll be talking about uh, Oscar Lange's uh, view of Right, you want me to continue? Okay. Uh, Oscar Lange's view of Russian economic uh, uh, management. I've called it Russian economic management. I should uh, really have called it Soviet economic management because that was uh, uh, that's what that was what it was in his lifetime and uh, inevitably uh, it was very much tied in with uh, Lange's uh, economics uh, and his politics uh, let me uh, Okay, uh, Oscar Lange was born in 1904. He had in his youth, uh, he had tuberculosis of the hip and this uh, really affected him all, all his life um, so that uh, he died in uh, rather prematurely in, in 1961. His uh, 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 Oscar Lange is, uh, his, his, uh, his economic views uh, may be uh, regarded as either neoclassical Marxist. He was certainly a neoclassical economist we owe a lot of welfare economics, uh, for example, neoclass standard neoclassical welfare economics to Oscar Lange. Um, he was also a leading figure, uh, as I will mention in the neoclassical synthesis. 
interpretation of Keynes, but he was also a Marxist. Uh, he insists he wrote on Marxism. Uh, he was uh, politically a socialist, politically on the left. So uh, it's this combination which makes him uh, rather uh, unusual. Uh, his views on uh, Russian uh, or Soviet economic management uh, or planning, um, I've divided uh, roughly into four periods. Uh, the first period was from uh, the 1920s to uh, 1939. Then uh, his uh, uh, he, uh, his activities in 19, from 1940 to 1948, where his views uh, evolved, um, and then from 1948 to 1952, they changed or they apparently changed. Then from 1952 to 1956. Uh, they changed the game and then from 1956 really to the end of his life uh, in 1965 um, they um, as if uh, returned to work to where they were uh, perhaps uh, at the beginning or they they, they went on to uh, 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 maybe a synthesis. Um, he died uh, incidentally in 1965 he uh, he went to Italy and was taken ill and uh, was eventually uh, flown uh, to London for medical treatment and he died uh, not far from where I am now uh, in Westminster hospital. Okay, here's, um, uh, I'll just give uh, an outline of his background and his, uh, uh, his studies uh, and his politics as they influenced his views on uh, Soviet economic planning. Uh, he was born in Tomaszów in Russian Poland uh, in, in 1904. His father was a, a, a factory owner, um, a little bit like uh, uh, Kalecki, but uh, in the case of Langer, uh, the father was a, 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 a managed to survive the 1905 uh, revolution and uh, subsequently Polish independence and remained uh, 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 fairly prosperous through the 1920s and 30s, possibly because he was a different line of business. Uh, Kalitsky's father was uh, a, a textile, um, uh, uh, was in the textile business uh, Langer's father was uh, 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 built, uh, was a furniture maker. Uh, he was uh, 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 by religion. They were originally, I think, the family came from Germany, uh, but they had become uh, Polonized, settled in Poland, uh, and over generation had become Polonized. Uh, although they retained. Uh, the, the Lutheran uh, religion. Okay, um, Langer from uh, from his youth uh, sympathized when he was still at school. He sympathized with uh, the, the, the Russian uh, uh, Revolution. He determined uh, to study economics, which at that time was taught in law faculties. So he. Uh, 
he studied uh, law and economics at uh, the uh, at Poznan um, uh, and uh, subsequently, sorry, in the 1920s, uh, and subsequently in Krakow uh, at the ancient Jagiellonian University. He had doctorates in both statistics and economics and certainly made uh, uh, for him economic methodology uh, was definitely one of the uh, 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 was one of formalization he was one of the pioneers of the formalist revolution uh, for uh, mathematizing economics uh, because of his politics uh, he, uh, 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 he he was unable to get a uh, a job uh, uh, teaching economics. He could teach statistics. He taught statistics, and then in 1934 left for the U.S. Uh, for well, for for the U.K. first, and then the U.S. on a Rock Rockefeller Fellowship. Uh, politically, uh, he was active in an organization, the Zvyozek Nezalevne Mojevic Socialistifne. The Union of Independent Socialist Youth, uh, which is very much uh, a, an organization bringing together uh, uh, young um, uh, uh, students, uh, mostly. So it was ha had roots in the uh, in the intelligentsia, uh, less so among the, the working class. Uh, it operated on the fringes of the uh, uh, of the Polish Socialist Party, which itself was uh, split into various factions. And Lange, uh, uh, Lange himself was expelled from the uh, Polish Socialist Party around uh, 1927 uh, for for his uh, activities. Uh, in 1938, he published in America uh, a, an important article, which was, uh, which is really, I guess, his best known uh, um, economic paper on uh, the economic theory of socialism. Uh, this was a uh, 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 this this is a paper in which he took issue with the Austrian critique of socialism, the Austrian critique that had been enunciated by uh, von Mises and uh, Hayek, in which they argued that uh, in the wake of the Russian Revolution that uh, socialism was destined to failure because uh, the uh, it, it, once you got rid of markets uh, you didn't have uh, the mechanism uh, that would create prices uh, which would bring mark which could bring markets to equilibrium so so socialism would descend uh, into chaos and lack of coordination between supply and demand. And in this uh, article, as probably many of you uh, know, uh, uh, Lange uh, argued that actually you don't need markets to uh, develop uh, uh, equilibrium prices. Uh, you can get by using uh, uh, with the central planner uh, taking the place of the Varesian auctioneer uh, announcing prices and instructing uh, firms to maximize profits to in other words the difference between prices and costs and you it, it, uh, if they uh, 
if you find that supplies, uh, stocks start building up or in certain uh, uh, industries or um, you find uh, excess demand in other industries, then this is a signal to the uh, uh, planners to adjust the prices either up or down until they get to their equilibrium uh, prices. Uh, and it's therefore you don't you don't need the actual uh, markets you can do this within a system of social ownership of the means of production um, and I believe this uh, article you can still find it uh, in the internet but a less well-known article uh, uh, of his was published in 1934, only recently uh, translated uh, into English, um, was uh, one that he wrote with uh, a Polish monetary economist, Marek Wright, uh, uh, called the, the, the Way to the Socialist Planned uh, Economy. Uh, it was published in, in Polish in 1934 uh, and it gives uh, an additional uh, insight into uh, Langer's views on socialism and uh, his, um, uh, uh, his views on the way in which the socialist economy uh, should operate and in particular uh, discusses briefly uh, the uh, uh, what had happened to Soviet economic planning. Um, in the wake of the, uh, 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 this article was written in the wake of uh, the the Great Crash and the uh, the arrival of the Great Depression um, among countries in Europe. Poland was the the hardest hit. Um, by uh, the, uh, 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 the the Great Depression, hardest hit in terms of decline or a, of economic uh, activity and rise of unemployment, um, mainly because Poland uh, was uh, uh, among the, the the larger countries in Europe, the the, the one that was most dependent on foreign direct investment and when that uh, dried up it really hit uh, uh, the economy uh, very very badly um, he uh, 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 in this article uh, Langer discussed um, can you uh, the, the, the question of whether it's possible to uh, get the capitalist economy back moving again or, or do you uh, or, or, or do you have to move towards a different type of economy, socialist economy and he argued here that uh, it's not possible uh, to get back uh, to the capitalist economy and in particular uh, the uh, 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 an, an economy with high levels of employment and this was because of the damage done to the price mechanism uh, uh, by uh, the processes of concentration and centralization of capital in other words monopoly capital had uh, resulted in a situation where the price mechanism it's no longer uh, flexible and uh, the system uh, 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 the system itself rather than socialism being the, the, the chaos that Mises and Hayek expected it was capitalism that was the, 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 the chaos uh, uh, the, of disproportions that uh, 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 
the, 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 um, the, that had uh, arisen within capitalism. Uh, he then, uh, and therefore you had to move on to uh, uh, socialism. Uh, and he then uh, put forward a, a rather uh, intriguing uh, model of socialism uh, uh, regulated, uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, a model in which output and employment are uh, regulated uh, by the central bank. Not quite the new consensus on monetary policy, but uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the concept of the central bank uh, uh, as regulating uh, the economy um, is an interesting one. Okay, in America, he uh, he, he wrote uh, this paper on uh, the economic theory of socialism. 1940, uh, the situation changed after the invasion of Poland. Um, the Polish Socialist Party went into exile. Uh, Lange joined uh, the Polish Socialist Party in exile. Interestingly enough, uh, the, Poli the, the Polish Socialist Party in exile dissolved the party uh, cells back in Poland, but remained active in the Polish government uh, 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 among the Polish emigres in London uh, and in, uh, uh, in the United States. By then, uh, Lange was working uh, at uh, the University of Chicago where uh, he was something of an attraction because by then he had uh, he had become the leading uh, mathematical uh, economist and Chicago uh, wanted to uh, be part of this new trend as uh, 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 the formalist uh, revolution, but I guess uh, they would also have been attracted to uh, his view uh, that the, uh, the, the, the the capitalist uh, market economy uh, uh, wasn't functioning properly and the dysfunction was caused by um, the uh, 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 the creation uh, by uh, monopolies and uh, the, the failure of flexible prices. Um, uh, this would have been attractive to Chicago because uh, Chicago, together with people like Joseph Schumpeter at uh, Harvard, and this was their criticism of uh, 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 the um, uh, of, of the uh, Roosevelt's New Deal because Ru uh, Roosevelt was um, uh, 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 was trying to organise markets, uh, stabilise prices uh, to prevent deflation, and the uh, the Austrian Chicago and the Austrians and Schumpeter thought that this was actually preventing the price adjustments that would uh, eventually bring uh, capitalism back into equilibrium. Uh, politically, Lange now campaigned for an alliance of bourgeois democracies with the Soviet Union uh, to defeat uh, Nazism and fascism. Even after uh, the uh, 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 the, the, the break uh, of relation, diplomatic relations between the Polish government in exile and uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union and the Soviet government uh, when uh, the uh, 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 Germans discovered uh, the bodies of uh, Polish officers that had been massacred by uh, the, who had been in internment in the Soviet Union, they'd be massacred by the 
and KVD. Um, Langer then scandalized. Uh, uh, Langer continued to, to argue that uh, only the, uh, the war with the Soviet Union could defeat fascism. That was the main uh, priority. In 1944, uh, he was invited uh, to Moscow. Uh, he had uh, a famous interview with um, uh, um, uh, uh, with Roosevelt. Uh, he was flown to Amer he was flown to Alaska, and from Alaska was flown by military airplane to uh, Moscow, where he met with Stalin and the Polish army that was being formed in uh, the uh, uh, in the Soviet Union. At this time, uh, Langer, uh, Langer had already changed his mind. Uh, he'd certainly changed his mind on the future of um, capitalism. He had uh, read the uh, Keynes's general theory and became one of the advocates of a neoclassical synthesis version, a uh, general equilibrium version of Keynesianism. This is his um, famous paper on full employment and the optimum, uh, uh, on the optimum rate of interest. Uh, something like this, and his uh, um, uh, this is this was uh, one of the founding documents of the neoclassical synthesis. He also gave lectures on Soviet planning, where he argued that, of course, the centralized planning was a transitional feature uh, uh, of the war, and that in future, uh, after the war. Uh, the Soviet Union will recognize the need for a more efficient allocation of resources. And uh, in that situation, uh, it will, uh, the, the importance of the price mechanism will be, uh, will be recognized. He also uh, favored uh, a more for him, for Poland in particular, he favoured uh, a much more much more of a mixed economy in which cooperatives would play an uh, important uh, part. Uh, in uh, incidentally, as a result of his political activities, um, he. Uh, in 1945, he threw in his lot, uh, 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 he supported the new Polish government established by, uh, in Poland after the war. Uh, the, a, a, a new Polish Socialist Party was established within uh, Poland and uh, Lange was uh, Ex uh, expelled for the second time from the Polish Socialist Party by its leadership, its remaining leadership in, um, uh, 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 in London. Uh, Langer then uh, worked uh, first as Polish ambassador to uh, um, the United States uh, in um, uh, in the uh, in Washington, he uh, to do this he had to resign his American uh, citizenship, and this was uh, a, a major disappointment to him, and eventually led to the breakup uh, of his family. In 1948, as the uh, Cold War uh, set in and uh, with uh, wars in, uh, uh, in Southeast Asia uh, and, uh, uh, and Korea. Uh, the, 
uh, the, the Polish communists who uh, never had much support uh, within uh, Poland for historic uh, reasons. Uh, uh, they, it was decided that they and the new uh, Polish Socialist Party that had been established in post-war Poland uh, would be united. Um, and in 1948, the Polish Socialist Party uh, held a uh, unification congress at which Langer renounced his previous uh, views uh, and uh, uh, in particular his previous views on uh, um, on Soviet economic planning and uh, recommended the, the, the formation, the unification of the Polish Socialist Party with the Polish Workers' Party into the Polish uh, United Workers' Party in which uh, the Polish Socialists uh, definitely had a junior role. Uh, Langer now advocated uh, the Soviet model and this became a standard feature of the economics uh, literature uh, at the time uh, uh, during the Stalinist period with um, not only uh, 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 with advocates of any alternative being denounced for uh, um, for, uh, for their failure to recognize um, the pioneering role and the leading role of the Soviet Union and its working class uh, and the way in uh, 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 and the fact that it had shown the way for economic uh, development. It not only won the war, but showing the way uh, forward. And this model include, included state planning and uh, centralized planning of, uh, of industry. Centralization, which in Poland, as in the Soviet Union, got worse as uh, the, uh, uh, as the industrialization push uh, proceeded uh, because with, uh, um, uh, 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 with the Cold War, with the arms race, uh, the uh, Polish industry, as with Soviet industry, succumbed to shortages and the answer to shortages was to centralize um, decision making even more in the belief that if you centralize decision making you would uncover where those hidden reserves were in the economy which could be used to, uh, 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 to alleviate the economic uh, difficulties. Uh, so that this was uh, the situation up until 1954. Uh, what changed in 1952? Well, 1952, um, they uh, saw the publication of uh, Stalin's um, booklet, uh, The Economic Problems of Socialism, in uh, the USSR. Uh, and for those that have uh, uh, read this uh, booklet, uh, this, uh, this was where uh, Stalin criticised uh, the uh, uh, over-centralisation and in particular uh, argued that uh, the uh, 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 errors had been made in economic planning and those errors uh, were due to 
and the failure to recognize that there were laws um, which uh, transcended uh, the uh, uh, laws of capitalist political economy which transcended the mode of production and were remained valid even after uh, the triumph of uh, socialism. So uh, uh, the uh, Langer, uh, hey, uh, in particular, the, uh, there was an ambiguous uh, endorsement of the price mechanism under what came to be known as the law of value, uh, that prices had to somehow relate to costs, and in particular, the costs of la labor, and this, this had been neglected. Uh, Langer Hale, and if I can just uh, read out, uh, and note this is, uh, where have I got this? Here we are, his, um, uh, the first paragraph, Langer wrote a review of this, the first paragraph of which uh, was widely translated in, uh, including into English. So we, uh, it starts off the appearance of Joseph Stalin's work, Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR is a great event in the history of learning and particularly in that of political economy. It is an event of profound theoretical significance as well as of far-reaching practical importance. The work sums up the contemporary experiences of nations and defines the fundamental laws of governing their behavior. Uh, in it have been stated and analyzed the most important economic laws of contemporary societies, both of societies developing under socialist conditions of production and of those still living uh, under the capitalist system. And it just goes on and on and then quotes this in line with the work of Engels, Marx and, uh, uh, and Lenin. Um, so it's, uh, uh, but it had its, uh, it, it, it contributed to uh, a certain loss of reputation by Langer even among some of his friends uh, in, uh, some people who stayed loyal to him uh, in, in the US. And it's still uh, remembered with a certain distaste. However, there was a point uh, in Langer's uh, 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 review, which he picked up, uh, and that was the echo with the uh, uh, with his earlier ideas before the war, that uh, the, the price mechanism is important, and that the socialist economy can operate a price mechanism. Uh, after 1956, uh, he uh, returned uh, uh, to favour. He became the chairman of the Economic Council, uh, sort of an advisory body of the top economists uh, who were supposed to advise on and supervise uh, an economic, the economic reform program. Uh, he advocated decentralization and incentives for efficiency. Uh, the uh, unfortunately, after 1959, uh, the reforms stalled uh, in Poland. Uh, they, they stalled because uh, what uh, of, uh, there had been uh, a, a certain a modicum of success with the five-year plan from 1950. Uh, uh, to uh, to 1956, five-year plan covering uh, that period, and an ambitious plan had uh, 
had been put forward for the following five years, which turned out to be uh, excessive. And there were various technical uh, reasons uh, for this. But th there was a similar trend uh, in the Soviet Union with uh, following Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin at 20th uh, Party Congress. Uh, Langer then uh, started taking an interest in, uh, uh, even though it, from 1959 gradually the, the work of the Economic Council uh, started being, uh, 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 was run down and it eventually um, ceased. Uh, Langer by then uh, had quite an important uh, political position um, alongside uh, the, uh, uh, the head of the or the party secretary of the Polish United Workers uh, Party, Gomułka. Uh, and his, poli his political work really left him with little time for, um, uh, for academic work. Uh, his last works uh, really were not on a, uh, a par with uh, his earlier writings. But he did, uh, in uh, before he died, uh, publish uh, his uh, last paper, uh, The Computer and uh, the Market. Uh, this was a, a paper in which he uh, argued that with computerization, um, it's possible even more quick, uh, 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 even more quickly, even more speedily to reproduce a market mechanism within uh, or, or a, a kind of market setting of prices uh, uh, within a centrally planned economy with the central planners uh, determining prices. So this was uh, his uh, paper uh, on uh, uh, the computer and the market which he contributed to a festschrift for uh, the English economist uh, Morris Dobb. Uh, this came partly out of his interest in the work of two Soviet e economists. Uh, Langer visited the Soviet Union in 1961 and was particularly taken uh, with the work of Leonid Kantorovich and Vasily uh, Nemshinov. Uh, they who had, uh, who were putting forward linear programming as answers to uh, uh, efficient uh, planning. Uh, and they, it, it was why uh, on a uh, 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 on a side note, Lange also took a, a, a big interest in, uh, unlike Kalecki, in uh, Straffer's uh, production of commodities by means of commodities. Uh, also, I would say, as a, maybe as a lead into the uh, or as a trailer for the next lecture, uh, the uh, uh, Langer followed. Langer knew Leontius uh, quite well, and he, uh, in fact, he stayed uh, at the Leontius when he visited Harvard in the 1940s during the Second World War. He knew them quite well and took a huge interest in Leontiev's work on linear programming. So uh, let me conclude 
uh, now. Uh, Lange uh, took a, a critical attitude towards Soviet econ economic uh, management, Soviet economic planning, but this fluctuated with the political situation. And I, I guess this is why um, he, uh, those that didn't like him, tended to accuse him of uh, political opportunism. Uh, but there was a consistent, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing off now. There was a consistent commitment to a neoclassical ideal that prices and exchange ratios bring the system of production to an efficient equilibrium. Um, unfortunately, and I think this is the weakness, uh, there are two weaknesses in this. First of all, the possibility of whether prices can bring about an economic equ equilibrium. And I think this goes back to Lange's misreading of Keynes. Uh, that it's not, in a market economy, it's not the prices that bring the system into equilibrium, but it's the, uh, it's the level of investment. And uh, this is, uh, uh, for me, is the essence of, of Keynes uh, and Kalecki. Uh, it's the, um, what, um, uh, what Lange also overlooked, which was later uh, admitted by his friend and follower, Vladimir Bruce, is that uh, the, 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 the real problem was the politicization of production. Because if you make economic planning um, the subject of political campaigns, inevitably uh, you uh, make the targets in the plan the subject of political declarations of who's going to achieve socialism fastest. And it's this that uh, introduces uh, the distortions, uh, the overemphasis on uh, heavy industry and steel production, uh, the under uh, uh, um, uh, 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 the underinvestment in consumption and services uh, that uh, were the, the problems that eventually emerged. And of course, uh, we know that the final years of the Soviet Union. Uh, the years of stagnation uh, were not really due to a failure, or um, I guess there are people who will still argue that it was a failure uh, of, um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, price mechanisms. Uh, the Austrians will argue this, but it was really a failure of underinvestment. So this is my conclusion. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Okay, <clears throat> dear friends, uh, I'm your missing chairman, Vladimir Avtonomov. I beg your pardon for not being able to overcome technical difficulties in time. Uh, but now I'm with you and I thank Jan for a very interesting presentation. Now, please, uh, your questions are welcome. I have my own problem. I'll uh, begin with my question. Uh, it looks like Lange's uh, connection with Russia were twofold, with Russian economic experience were twofold. First, Russia, uh, he considered Russia as an embodiment of an ideal, of an ideal of central but not ethicist planning and uh, uh, rather bad embodiment of this planning and argued for uh, further uh, decentralization, etc. And uh, the second one was, uh, as you underlined, politically conditioned and uh, 
it fluctuated with the political situation. But my question is, how far was Lange familiar with the practice of Soviet planning, with a real practice, not ideal practice, but real practice? Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, actually, I don't think uh, that uh, Lange uh, had uh, that much uh, practical uh, experience. Uh, is certainly uh, unlike, uh, well, let's say, his uh, his friend and uh, colleague Vladimir Bruce. Uh, Bruce, uh, where uh, Bruce uh, had very direct experience of. Uh, Soviet planning, uh, be uh, because he uh, 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 Bruce fled to uh, the Soviet zone of occupation in 1939 and worked in a uh, uh, in a Russian factory uh, until the uh, uh, until Germany invaded the Soviet Union and the Polish army was established, but. Uh, 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 Bruce had that experience and had uh, felt very critical of it. He thought uh, that uh, 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 production was, mo was most efficient. Uh, Langer's uh, knowledge of um, uh, Soviet planning was very, uh, it was first of all theoretical. It was what he got. Uh, from reading uh, uh, academic uh, papers and academic discussions. And then it came from when he did visit the Soviet uh, Union, uh, it came, uh, he was making official visits. Um, so uh, yes, of course, he was taken uh, around uh, the uh, uh, Soviet um, uh, 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 factories and you know where uh, you know which were on show so uh, this uh, he knew about uh, uh, decidedly he knew um, how things worked in Poland because um, although he was he was a witness uh, he wasn't a, actually a witness but his um, he participated in a uh, in a bizarre um, uh, uh, incident in 1956 when a group of very distinguished uh, 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 British economists, among them Morris Dobb, Joan Robinson, uh, Richard Kahn, Robert Meek, they're all uh, progressive or left-wing economists had visited Poland. They'd been taken off to see a factory in, uh, um, uh, uh, as always happened with visiting uh, 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 visiting delegations, and they were taken off to see the Poznań Railway Works uh, factory just at the time when uh, the, the the authorities had announced an increase in the price of bread, uh, the workers who had experienced uh, a genuine hardship during the, uh, 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 in, in, during the previous period uh, were outraged by this, marched out of the factory just as the delegation arrived. They marched out of the factory only to be met by um, uh, the army uh, who uh, uh, and to be shot, uh, shot at in front of, uh, and some of them killed in front of this English delegation. The English delegation went back to uh, to Warsaw to be met by Oscar Langer, who uh, gave them a, a a talk in which uh, he tried to uh, mollify their their leftist outrage by saying that of course what they had witnessed showed that even in socialism there were certain contradictions and 
you know, one had to face up to these contradictions uh, and uh, and deal with them uh, uh, properly and, and effectively, and they uh, only to be uh, 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 and the response to this was an outraged uh, 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 polemic from Joan Robinson, uh, who who asked him how he how he dared to describe what they had witnessed uh, in such terms. So it was, um, to some extent, uh, he knew this, he knew that there was, but he was also, he, he was aware that there was inefficiency, economic uh, inefficiency, as well as uh, these uh, political uh, problems. Uh, but he clung to, to the neoclassical idea that they could be overcome by means of uh, a, uh, a, a, an effective use of the price mechanism. Thank you very much, Jan. Now, Denis Melnik, please. Denis, you rose your hand. Yes, 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 sorry. <laughs> Um, and this is a technical issue, so as always. So I wonder, Jan, you uh, distinguish like several stages in uh, Lange's attitude to Soviet planning, to planning mechanism. So I wonder, is this uh, more like, uh, is this more connected to political situation, to his personal situation, or we can trace uh, these uh, some changes uh, in his theoretical, in his analytical approach, according to lines of this division? Uh, I, uh, yes, I mean, certainly uh, his personal uh, uh, situation did affect uh, his views. Uh, and he had this tendency, uh, in particular, uh, uh, during the Second World War to put himself forward as uh, being uh, the man who could mediate uh, political tensions and who could uh, uh, who could see the way forward. Um, his, um, his favorite student who uh, with whom I was quite close, Adolf Kavalik, uh, said that uh, in this respect he was uh, he was perhaps naive. He certainly believed that um, his uh, his post-war politics were based on the idea that uh, the uh, things could only work out properly uh, if um, the Soviet Union remained in alliance with the Western bourgeois democracies. Uh, so um, uh, 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 this was why he took the political line that he did in 1945. And then uh, the, the impression one finds uh, that uh, is that he was, um, uh, he found himself uh, 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 he became disillusioned. Uh, in 1959, uh, J.K. Galbraith visited Poland and subsequently published a, a diary of his visit in which uh, he describes meeting Lange. Well, it's not that Lange's name isn't given, but it's fairly obvious that this is Lange. And Lange tells uh, Galbraith that uh, he had, he believes he had, he, i.e. Lange, had made a mistake in coming back to Poland in 1945. So, uh, or after the war. So his, uh, uh, he had, I think there was a, a degree of personal disillusionment. But the, the practical, uh, uh, another practical experience, which I, uh, I think I do want to uh, investigate more, it would would have been uh, his uh, recollection or uh, his experience of the the NEP period 
uh, between um, the, uh, the end of war communism and uh, the start of industrial forced industrialization in um, uh, in 1929 because this was a time when um, uh, the uh, Russia um, uh, uh, experimented and to some degree experimented successfully uh, with uh, with market mechanisms and uh, it was certainly known about in Poland uh, because uh, uh, he, uh, the uh, Polish economy uh, revived after after the crisis of independence uh, and to, to some extent was stabilized the currency stabilization uh, that occurred after 1925 uh, to some degree was due to uh, trade with the Soviet Union trade which took place um, uh, under the uh, under NEP under the new economic policy of uh, uh, started by Lenin so uh, I think this is uh, uh, um, this may have influenced him but I, I really have to investigate this uh, some more Thank you very much. Uh, now, Alek Ananin, please. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Parovsky, for your presentation. Uh, I, my question concerns uh, the, the last period of Lange's life and his paper about the computer and, and market. Now it is sometimes referred to uh, with uh, regard to new developments in computerization, uh, information technologies, and so on and so forth. Uh, do you know what was the background behind this paper? Because it seems that it goes uh, somewhat in somewhat different way as compared with uh, the works of Kantarovich, Nemchinov, and others at that period who were thinking about uh, such, uh, such things. It's, it's different from them. Yeah, yes, uh, it, it is different from them because the, um, is the, the, the Kantorovich solutions were, uh, and the Nemchinov solutions, um, as I recall, uh, and, and my recollection of them is not, uh, is uh, entirely uh, focused. Uh, is uh, uh, the, those solutions were uh, of a linear programming uh, type, uh, which would have been suitable for uh, a, a totally uh, uh, centralized system. They didn't uh, have uh, the uh, the idea of uh, finding, uh, 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 let's say, of uh, asking state enterprises to um, maximize an objective uh, function uh, and then having prices uh, or profits as part of that uh, uh, objective uh, function. So, uh, a but he was uh, he was inter uh, uh, Langer was interested in them because uh, he thought that they were moving towards a more scientific understanding of um, uh, 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 of production and a more uh, um, and in particular the, uh, the the importance of production ratios. Uh, which the, the production ratios which were necessary for efficient uh, 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 for economic efficiency yeah yeah thank you in particular to Vladimir for your kind invitation to Moscow <laughs> uh, probably 
Uh, everyone knows Moscow, but probably hardly a few of you have heard of the University of Hohenheim. Uh, but uh, my university has two characteristics which might be interesting in our context. First, it's the only university you can find in the name index of Schumpeter's history of economic analysis <laughs> uh, due to the fact that Paracelsus, whom you may consider as an early founder of health economics, was born on the ground of where the university is now. Second, my university was founded in 1818 by Katarina Pavlovna, the granddaughter of Katarina the Great and sister of Alex Tsar Alexander I, <laughs> who had married the crown prince of Württemberg. Now let me come to the topic of my presentation. Now you all know Leontjev's work on input-output analysis, but as an economist you are trained to exploit your comparative advantages. Therefore, I focus on Leontjev's German period. It is now exactly 50 years ago, in June 1970, that I first heard a lecture given by Vasily Leontjev at the University of Kiel, where I was a young student, and where he received the Bernard Harms Prize honor at that time, three years before he got the Nobel Prize. And Leontjev gave a long lecture in excellent German with a heavy Rus Russian accent, the same accent he had when he was speaking English. Now, um, my presentation is focusing on four subjects. First, uh, Leontjev's German biography. Second, his Berlin PhD thesis, The Economy as a Circular Flow. Third, a topic on which he worked in the 1980s, but which is, has strong links to his skilled period in the Weimar Republic years, technical progress and unemployment. And finally, uh, his work on statistical supply and demand analysis, where he was engaged in a famous pitfalls controversy with Ragnar Frisch, who had attacked Leontjev's method, and which continued uh, when he was already in the United States in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. So the last topic marks Leontjev's traverse from Germany to the United States. Now, uh, I should make a short personal comment. Uh, in the 1990s, I was one of the managing editors of the journal Structural Change and Economic Dynamics, where in 91, an English translation of Leontjev's PhD thesis was published, and where another managing editor was Faye Dukin, who was the acting director of the Institute for Economic Analysis at New York University, which had been founded by Leontjev after his retirement from Harvard University in 1975. And Faye Dukin was one of three outstanding women economists who came out of Leontjev's group. The other two were Karen Polanski and Ann Carter. And Faye Dukin was responsible for a special issue of our journal honoring Vasily Leontjev's 90th birthday. And when in early 95, at that time convinced that Leontjev had been born in, in 1906 in St. Petersburg, I was asking Faye Dukin, what is the exact deadline for the submission of the paper? She responded, oh, Herod, you are too late. Vasily recently has been in St. Petersburg and found out that in fact, he was already born in 1905 and not in 1906. Now, some of you may know that in fact, he also was not born in St. Petersburg, but in Munich. I have here a document uh, from the city council of Munich, which was uh, given in 2005. Munich is listed here 
is very difficult to see, but it's an official document which had been asked for by Leontief's only child, his daughter Svetlana Alpers, after the mother Estelle Marx, who had married Leontief shortly after the arrival in the United States in 1932, also had been died. Now, what is qu quite interesting is you find this document, by the way, also on the website of the International Input Output Association. But what is interesting is that in May 2020, if you go on the website of the Sve Swedish Reichsbank, uh, which gives the prize in economic science in memory of Alfred Nobel, the, it still reads that Vasily Leontiev was born in St. Petersburg on the 5th of August, 1906. And this error is even engraved on Leontiev's tombstone in Connecticut. Now, uh, Leontiev had visited uh, St. Petersburg in the early 1990s, and he came across uh, a woman whose name was Kalia Daina, who did some research on the Leontiev family, and there the correct dates uh, are given. Now, uh, Leontiev's German biography started, in fact, when he was a baby and lasted for one year before the family went back uh, to St. Petersburg. And uh, that was after, on the 17th of July, 1906, his father, Vasily Leontiev Sr., got his PhD degree in economics from the University of Munich. And during his period, he had already studied at the High School of Commerce in Leipzig, where he got the diploma degree in 1901. A year before Vasily was born, he had come to know his wife, Slata Becker, who was out of a Jewish family from Odessa. He had met his wife in Paris and they married in London. And a year after the later Nobel Prize winner was born, Vasily Leontiev Jr., when the family went back to St. Petersburg, they registered the birth of their son a second time with the Orthodox Church, as you better know than I do, uh, was quite common uh, in Russia at the time that the births of children were registered with the Orthodox Church. And this happened in 1906, a second time in St. Petersburg. Interesting is also that uh, in the official CV, which uh, Leontiev had to deliver and to submit to the University of Berlin when he applied for the PhD degree, uh, this is his own text where it starts, I translated from German into English, I, Vasily Leontiev, have been born in St. Petersburg on the 5th of August, 1906. At the same document, he mentioned the main teachers at the University in St. Petersburg. And at the end, three uh, professors at the University of Berlin, of whom two, namely Sombart and Bortkiewicz, became the two referees of his PhD thesis. Now, here is the full document of Leontiev's PhD thesis, which a friend of mine from Berlin was able to get after the breaking down of the Berlin Wall, because the Berlin University is centered in the city center of Berlin, this, but this was part of the Soviet zone where it was difficult for West Germans to go to until 1989, until 1990. And fortunately, Leontiev had lost the document in the meantime, and we were able to give a good copy to him, with, of which he was very pleased. Uh, fortunately, the archive of the Humboldt University in Berlin was not destroyed uh, during uh, the bombing of Berlin in the Second World War. So this is the original document uh, from December 1928, where everything is in Latin, 
And you can see here the name of the university at that time was not Humboldt University. Humboldt, Werner von Humboldt had founded the University of Berlin in 1810. Uh, since 1947, it's called again Humboldt University, but in the Weimar Republic years, it was still called Friedrich Wilhelm University. Here's the name of the rector, and there's the name of the PhD candidate, Vasily Leontiev, I have split it for better reading into two parts of the next two pages. And you see everything is in Latin. You also see the degree was given by the philosophical faculty. Uh, there were two different traditions in the German language area. As long as only in the 20th century when slowly it developed that economics or economic and the social sciences became uh, special faculties. In the old system with only four faculties, theology, medicine, law and philosophy, when economics came up in Austria, economics became part of the law faculty so that later famous economists like Schumpeter first had to make a degree in law Whereas in the Prussian system, economics became part of the philosophical faculty. And this happened in Berlin, and therefore Leontiev got his PhD degree from the philosophical faculty. The only words which are listed in German are, is the title of his PhD thesis, Die Wirtschaft als Kreislauf, the economy as a circular flow. And the other thing you can find is the degree uh, which he got for his uh, uh, PhD degree, namely cum laude, which is only the third best uh, degree in the German system. Uh, we still have it. Uh, it comes from Latin, namely summa cum laude as the best degree, highest honors, then magna cum laude, then cum laude and then rite. So Vasily Leontiev, the later Nobel Prize winners, and I like to tell it students when they have, are not satisfied with a magna cum laude, with his PhD degree, you can tell you even become, can become a later Nobel Prize winner if you only get a cum laude in your PhD degree. Uh, this is from the 17th of December, uh, 1921. So, uh, as I mentioned before, Vasily Leontiev Jr. Uh, was born in Germany, in Munich, because of the fact that his father, Vasily Leontiev Sr., had been a PhD candidate at the University of Munich at the time. And what is quite interesting is that his father, who had already studied in uh, Germany and Leipzig, came to Munich because of his main supervisor, Lujo Brentano, who at that time was, besides Schmoller, one of the best known German professors at the time, and the most liberal and the most Anglophile. And among the members of the German historical school, Brentano was the strongest supporter of trade unions, which he considered to be the decisive means to solve the labor question. Brentano also had been in close contact with Alfred Marshall for a long time, over more than three decades, in particular on the social question and the labor movement. And Brentano was instrumental in publishing a German edition of Marshall's Principles of Economics, to which he wrote a preface and which were published in 1904, shortly before Vasily Leontiev Sr. finished his PhD thesis with Louis Brentano as the main supervisor. And it's quite, uh, by the way, in the Japanese edition of Marshall's Principles, the Japanese have also a Japanese translation of Brentano's forward to the German edition of Marshall's Principles. So 
Vasily Leontiev Sr., uh, who was more left wing as a Menshevist than his son and later Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> uh, he was a socialist and therefore it was quite natural that he went to Luio Brentano for his PhD degree, which was on the cotton industry in St. Petersburg and their workers. And he was well informed because of the fact that the Leontia family uh, was an old merchant family and they were old believers. Dennis Melnick will know that uh, uh, Daniela Raskov and Vadim Kufenko, who is here in Hohenheim, have written an article together on old believers and the parallels which are existing between economic activities of old believers in Russia and uh, Max Weber's analysis of the role of Protestant ethics in the genesis of modern capitalism. Uh, but the interesting thing is that Vasily Leontiev Sr. sometimes was agitating the workers in the cotton industry of his father in, Saint, in Petersburg. When I was a guest of the Leontiev Center in St. Petersburg 10 years ago, uh, then uh, some people went with me to the place where this factory once was uh, place. It doesn't exist anymore, but after the October Revolution, uh, the factory, the cotton factory of the Leontia family was socialized. So Leontia's father, after uh, making his PhD degree at the University of Munich, became professor for labor economics at the University of St. Petersburg, and in 1927, when the son was already living in Germany for two years, then the father, Vasily Leontiev Sr., started to work for the Russian embassy in Berlin until he was, until 1935, when he was called back by Stalin to Russia. <laughs> but this seemingly was too dangerous for him. Therefore, he decided not to follow this call back to Moscow, but staying in Berlin, not working for the Russian embassy anymore. But during almost 10 years, Vasily Leontiev Sr. was a lecturer on the Russian economy at the University of Berlin and quite active in publishing in leading scholarly journals in Germany at the time. And there's a lot of confusion existing in the secondary literature on Leontiev, where very often the work of Vasily Leontiev Jr. and Vasily Leontiev Sr. are mixed. There are only two articles. The very first article by uh, the Sun, uh, I have here the relevant uh, page. This is uh, uh, the, the article which was published in the Journal of the Kiel Institute of World Economics in 1925 by uh, Vasily Leontiev Jr. on the balance of the Russian economy, a methodological investigation, which uh, uh, also had been translated into English uh, later onwards and in the same year into Russia, Russian. But I think the original paper was written in 1925 in German. Now we know that the young author, the genius, was already 20 years old and not 19 years old when he wrote that article. But uh, that article uh, is quite interesting also for two things. Namely, first, that he puts a lot of emphasis that you can gain a better insight on a country or the economy of a, uh, a country and a plant economy only if the need for very detailed statistical empirical information would be fulfilled. And this is a main characteristic also of 
Leontief's later work on the input-output analysis in the United States and elsewhere. Second, already on the very first page of his very first article, you find explicit and detailed reference to Kinney's tableau economie, a fact which is also then coming up also in his Berlin PhD thesis uh, on the economy as a circular flow. So the interdependence between the different sectors of the economy is quite important and mentioned already in the very first article. But there are only two uh, German papers by Vasily Leontje, where you explicitly find Junior behind Vasily Leontje. And in the later publications of his father, they are also only listed in the 1930s as Vasily Leontje, not as Vasily Leontje Senior. There's only a second German article by Vasily Leontje Junior uh, from 1927 in uh, one of the oldest journals, the Jahrbücher für Nationalökonomie und Statistik, written in German, but on the statistics and empirics of uh, measures of concentration, where explicitly junior is listed. So, uh, to conclude with his father, after his, uh, the father and the mother also spent 12 years, again, second long period in Germany between 1927 and 1939. In November 1939, uh, their son, Vasily Leontiev Jr., who was already in the United States since September 1932, could manage to get uh, American visas for his parents and they were able to migrate to the United States. That was already after the beginning of the Second World War, but in November 1939, after the Hitler-Stalin Pact, there was no war yet between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. This only started in June 1941. And also Germany and the United States were not at war. This also started two years later after the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor when Hitler declared war also to the United States. So nevertheless, it was difficult and they were able to migrate via Italy and the ship from Italy to New York uh, to the United States. Now coming back to the son who came to Germany uh, to 1925, he was among a group of at least 10 famous Russian economists who migrated to, the, to Germany and not like the nobility to Paris. You probably all know movies with Greta Garbo where uh, Russian noblemen and women uh, were in Paris, but the intellectual elite after the Civil War or during the Civil War and after the October Revolution in Russia, for a greater part migrated uh, to Germany and not uh, to France. For example, in 1922 23, until the end of 23, when there was a currency reform after the hyperinflation in Germany, about 300,000 Russians were living in Berlin. And the district Charlottenburg was called Charlottograd at that time. You know, again, after 1990, you can find a greater Russian community there. But among the economists, there were two centers of gravitation for the uh, promising younger generation. One was the University of Heidelberg where Emil Lederer uh, was and where many Russians sta uh, started to study. And Heidelberg is not so far away from Baden-Baden, where a place where many Russians in the 19th century went to and where, for example, Dostoevsky made his uh, empirical studies in the casino 
of Bach and Baden for one of his major uh, works. And the other center was Berlin, particularly due to von Bodgevich, Ladislaus von Bodgevich, who himself had been born in St. Petersburg and who had done major work on Marx, for example, the transformation problem from value into prices. So uh, the young Vasily Leontiev went to Berlin in 1925, enlisted as a PhD student there, and he had to do additional PhD studies, mainly with Werner Sombart and von Bartkiewicz at the University of Berlin. But he did not uh, fi finalize his Berlin PhD thesis. He did finalize it at uh, the University of Kiel, at, uh, at particularly at the Kiel Institute of World Economics. I have here two photos. On the right side, you see Werner Zombart, who was the PhD supervisor of Vasily Leontiev in Berlin. But Zombart was a leading member of the historical school when the third, second and third volume of Marx Capital were published. Beside Lexis, who was the academic teacher of Bodkiewicz, Zombart was one of the very few German professors who reacted positively to Marx Capital. And therefore, Friedrich Engels had uh, the idea after the death of Marx that Zombard be could become a genuine successor of Marx. But when the Nazis came to power, Zombard behaved in a very opportunistic way. Uh, uh, he was not a Nazi himself, but he behaved in a very opportunistic way. But in the mid-1920s, he became uh, the PhD supervisor of Leontiev, but due to the fact that Sombart was not well trained in mathematics, and Leontiev was putting a lot of emphasis on mathematics, uh, therefore Bodkiewicz came in as the second referee of uh, Leontiev's PhD thesis. Now, among the larger group of uh, Russian economists who came uh, to Weimar, Germany in the 1920s, let me only mention uh, two others. One is listed at the very end. He was the very first who came in January 1919 already and was working himself at the Kiel Institute in 1928 or 30 when Leontiev was also partly there. So they were close colleagues. By the way, Marshak later was a close friend and colleague of Oskar Lange, and they spent some years together at the University of Chicago in uh, 43, 44, 45, beginning of 45, and also did a joint article on the keynes tinbergen controversy. And Marshak is important also for my final topic on Leontiev's work on elasticity of supply and demand curves. One of the other Russians beside the agricultural economist Boris Brutskus was Vladimir Wojtynski, who even was a minister of uh, economics in socialist Georgia in the early 1920s, a close friend of Marshak and also with some connections to Lenin as a left-wing Menshevist who became the chief economic advisor of the German trade unions in the later 1920s and after the second emigration uh, to the United States in 1933, a close advisor to the American trade unions also. Okay, so uh, I have put here a text uh, in many discussions I had with Adolf Lowe, who was born in 1893 but died in the age of 102 in 1995. And he told me in several conversations in the 1980s and early 1990s that uh, in, May, in March 27, he got a phone call from Werner Sombart from Berlin, who told him, I have here a young genius from Russia. Are you interested? Sombart knew Lowe was a regular participant 
in Zombard's PhD, uh, research seminar in Berlin in the early 1920s when he was working uh, for the German Ministry of Economics and the German Statistical Office. But in April 1926, Lowe became the founding director of a new department of research on business cycles at the Kiel Institute of World Economics. He hired Gerhard Kroem, Hans Neisser, Marschak, and also at the recommendation of Sombart, Leontiev in early, uh, in spring 1927. So that is the place where Leontiev was working for three and a half years in the four and a half years period between 27 and 31. It's an old villa which uh, was <laughs> financed by the famous steel baron Krupp, which located the Emperor Sailing Club. But when the Kiel Institute was founded in 1940, Krupp donated this building to the Kiel Institute. And this building is located at the Fjord, the Ford Fjord, uh, which is part of the Baltic Sea. Yeah, so not only St. Petersburg, but also Kiel is located at the Baltic Sea and directly in front of this building, there was the Olympic Harbor in 1936. So when the Olympic Games took place in Berlin in 1936, the sailing events took place in Kiel and the Olympic Harbor was located directly in front of the Kiel Institute. This is important for a story which will shortly follow. Uh, but uh, the bad thing for this Kiel Institute is that on the opposite side of the harbor, in a distance of about one mile, there were major shipyards, and particularly the shipyards where the German submarines were constructed. And these shipyards were heavily bombed in the Second World War and almost completely destroyed but not the places where the submarine was bought, but 80% of this building beside this right-wing part was destroyed uh, in the bombing of the Second World War. So today this is modern, this is old, but the director or the president of the institute was located here. And uh, the good thing is that uh, the Kiel Institute had at that time, and they still have in 2020, the best library in the world in economics. It's also the central library in economics for Germany. So they buy all the books and they are forced to buy copies of all leading publications that before the building was destroyed in 43 and the year before them, the bombing became heavier. Uh, the library was located to a small village and in the cellar of a cathedral. Now, when Adolf Lowe had his 100th birthday, Vasily Leontiev sent a congratulation letter to Lowe from New York. So you can see it here, New York University Institute for Economic Analysis, where Faye Dukin was the acting director from 1993. Dear Professor Lowe, I congratulate you on your 100th birthday. Now, uh, for better reading, I put out this part and want to read uh, just a little bit of text. Leontiev was referring that he was a member of the Low Seminar in Kiel between 27 and 31 and so on. And now let's say he was, he enjoyed sailing and there was a nice interview Leontiev gave in the mid 1970s just after moving from Harvard to New York to Leonard Silk, who was at that time the leading scientific journalist of the New York Times. And there the story is mentioned that he enjoyed sailing during his time at the Kiel Institute from 12 to 4. So for about four hours and a long break, uh, lunch break. And he says that I remember on many occasions while playing hooky Instead of sitting dutifully at my desk in my office, I was steering a sailing boat past the Institute and had to drop flat on the deck in order to escape the watchful eyes of Herrn Geheimrat Professor Harms surveying the blue waters from his desk 
facing the front window of a splendid office located on the second floor. So uh, here the office of the Professor Harms was located where he had the view and the audience was sitting flat when he was passing by in the sailing boat. <laughs> So uh, this is what Leontiev mentioned in 93 as a remembering uh, to his Kiel uh, period. Now, let me come uh, to his uh, Berlin PhD thesis, which you probably all know since 91, there's an English translation existing. And uh, we got Paul Samuelson at the time, who was uh, uh, a close friend of Leontiev. By the way, uh, Robert Solo, who was sitting and sharing your office with Samuelson for almost half a century, when he was a young PhD student at Harvard, had been the student assistant of Vasily Leontiev, which might explain why in Solo's interpretation of the Herod model in 56, the basic neoclassical model, he is referring to Higgs, a, a, a Herod as using a fixed coefficient model, which indeed Herod did not, but being trained as a Leontiev student and in input output analysis, you may come to this view. So, uh, Paul Samuelson wrote a very nice introduction uh, to the English translation of Berlin's. PhD thesis, and uh, uh, here uh, he uses a language which is linked to the famous operas by Richard Wagner, the famous ring in particular, because some reasons there mentioned that Leontius Berlin PhD thesis sounds as the very first note of the overture to his ring of input output. <laughs> But one has to say there is a relatively simple two sectoral model already existing, but many important elements or ingredients of uh, Leontiev's later work on input output analysis are not playing a major part in his Berlin PhD. For example, in contrast, to his very first 1925 article on the balance of the Russian economy in the PhD thesis on the economy as a circular flow, there's not a single reference to either Kine or to Karl Marx. Furthermore, as also emphasized by Samuelson, the thesis does not contain any manageable empirical measurement which is later a trademark also for Leontia's work on input-output analysis. It contains no matrices, but uh, is primarily from the mathematical point of view, taxonomic and topological. So uh, it's not more than an overture to the later ring of input-output. Now, uh, here I have uh, a copy of the front page of this, of the German PhD. Now one has to mention this uh, PhD thesis was published in two different channels as a small book or booklet because it had 45 pages. And uh, second, and the copy is from here, you see here Archiv für Sozialwissenschaft und Sozialpolitik which was the leading journal in economics and the social sciences in Germany between 1905, after Max Weber, Jaffe, and Werner Sombart became the managing editors of the journal. And uh, it was the only journal which had to cancel publication after the Nazis came to power in 33. Uh, in that journal, some famous articles by Bortkiewicz were published, it also contained the first article by which Ludwig von Mises launched the, social, the first round of the socialist cap, uh, calculation debate in the German language area in the 1920s, before the second round took place in the English uh, uh, area when Hayek uh, was the main 
Part on the one side and Lange, Lerner and Dickinson on the other side, as Pali mentioned by Jan Toporowski earlier. So uh, in that journal, which was edited by Emil Lederer, who was the supervisor of the PhD thesis and the habilitation thesis of Jacob Marshak at the University of Heidelberg, and the two co-associate editors of this journal at the time when the Leontiev thesis was published there were Alfred Weber, the younger brother of Max Weber, and Josef Schumpeter. And it is this journal where in 1926 the first Western translation of uh, Kondratyev's famous work on long waves was published and became known to the Western world for the non-Russian readers. And Schumpeter was very much impressed by that. Now, the last point I want to mention with regard to Leontius Berlin PhD thesis is uh, when we published the English translation and uh, uh, Samuelson wrote an introduction, Vasily Leontiev also insisted that we took this part from the report Botkevich was writing. By the way, the order is wrong here. The main supervisor was Sombat, but Sombat did not understand the mathematics. So Botkevich definitely, as the second referee, was more important, also responsible for the relatively negative degree of only cum laude. So Botkevich was mainly responsible for understanding the mathematics, but also heavily criticizing Leontiev and uh, giving this third degree only of cum laude. But Leontiev insisted that we publish that part of Botkevich's copy, only that part. Although I find much that is objectionable in it, this dissertation is without any doubt acceptable. In developing his, in my opinion, very doubtful theoretical constructs, the candidate received no guidance whatsoever from his academic teachers. He arrived at his present position quite independently, one might say, despite them. It is very likely that he will maintain this scientific point of view also in the future. <laughs> so, <laughs> which was the case, and of course, the work was more developed. Now, let me come relatively shortly because of time running out to two topics. Not Leontiev in his Kiel years between 1927 and 31, which was only interrupted by one year when he was in China surveying the construction of the railway network in China before he went from China to Kiel and he came back uh, from China to Kiel before he moved to the United States. Uh, he was working in the department on business cycles shared by Adolf Lowe at the time. And one favorable subject at the department, besides the theoretical and empirical analysis of business cycles, was structural change and the analysis of the employment consequences of the technological change. So the Ricardo machinery chapter. And from time to time, you have always major debates on that subject. Uh, 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 for example, there was an, an enormous debate in the late 1920s and early 1930s and the question whether the new technologies contributed to mass unemployment in the Great Depression. This is where the key group was interested in. Then today, it's a major subject the employment consequences of industry 4.0. And in the late 1970s, a debate uh, uh, started where in the 1980s, Leontiev played a major part. Uh, this was after the so called microelectronic revolution when industrial robots were in the center of the debate. And a work which had a major impact, probably the greatest impact uh, internationally published by Oxford University Press in 86, edited by Vasily Leontiev and Faye Dukin, was on the future impact of automation on workers. 
in which a special dynamic input output model had been used but and <coughs> at that time i was working at the university of bremen and heinz kurz was a close colleague of mine and we got a lot of money uh, from the volkswagen foundation to do similar uh, work uh, for the german economy so we had close interaction with Leontiem and particular Fay Dukin at the <coughs> New York Institute. And uh, we started with their dynamic input output model, which they had constructed. But there were two issues where we had further development. Uh, one uh, is related to the fact that you cannot treat it, the German economy as a closed economy as Leontiev and Dukin and the team had done for the US economy, where at that time, I think the share of export or imports in GDP was about 10%, but in Germany, where you had 30 to 50%, it was impossible. And this is a major complication uh, to do that work for an open economy, because then uh, exchange rates and many other complications, export, import demand, uh, which make the issue much more complicated to isolate uh, the employment effects of new technologies. And the second part, the complicated element, where we had a mathematician who elaborated that model, uh, when you have structural change, you have not only new sectors coming up or existing uh, sectors to grow, but also shrinking sectors like iron, coal, steel industry, shipbuilding, and so on. So you have negative growth rates. And negative growth rates of shrinking sectors make these input output models extremely complex and complicated from a mathematical point of view. This is an enormous problem. But uh, there's one thing which should be emphasized, particularly since Leontiev, who was not, uh, let's say, very often quoting earlier works, <laughs> never mentioned and Lo was quite critical of this, the PhD thesis of Alfred Kehler, which he finalized in 31 and which was published in 32 on the theory of labor displacement by machinery, in which the first part is on history of economic thought, starting with Ricardo's machinery problem up to Wicksell's critic of Ricardo's analysis. But then in the original part, Burkhardt, who later, no, Kehler, who later became uh, a professor at the New School in New York at the University of Exile also, uh, developed his own model. And he used what today you would call a static closed input output model with eight sectors, <coughs> as it is shown here, taken from an article from Christian Gerke, who, who uh, did two articles on Alfred Kehler as a pioneer of input-output analysis, which he also presented at the international meetings of the Input-Output Society. Now, Kehler had nine sectors, <coughs> two were linearly dependent, but basically so an eight sectoral static input-output model, which Kehler used as the basis of an assessment of the employment consequences of new technologies. Now let me come <coughs> to the final part. The major work which Leontiev had done at the Kiel Institute and which marks the uh, traverse or transition period also uh, to the United States. Now Leontiev was hired and had a full-time position at the department for business cycles, but he did not do main work <coughs> on the empirical and theoretical analysis of business cycles. He did also not the work for which he was hired, namely for the traffic sector. This was probably the reason why the Chinese hired him for the work in China on the construction of the Chinese railway system. But what he did was major work in the derivation of statistical supply and demand analysis. And there were leading articles. I should uh, do, this was 
a major new subject uh, coming up in the late 1920s. And the spiritus rector of this work, who more or less initiated uh, this work on statistical supply and demand analysis, was another great economist who came from Russia, Henry Schulz, who had been born in a Polish Jewish family in the former Russian Empire in 1893 in a small place which today belongs to Yellow Russia. And he became professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, Schulz, who also was responsible for the circulation of a relatively early translation of Slutsky's famous article on random shocks from 1927, which only a decade later was published in an English version in Econometrica. So uh, this article, which had an enormous uh, role to play for modern business cycle theory, particularly modern real business cycles, stochastic shocks, was also translated first by Henry Schulz. And Henry Schulz was the first who did important empirical and theoretical work on uh, statistical analysis of supply and demand. Now, I, on the second page, I have uh, one book which even was published in Germany on the sense of statistical demand analysis, in which there's also a chapter in which is quite critical of the Leontius method, but less hostile than Ragnar Frisch was. Now you have here again the nice haircut of the young Leontiev when he was engaged in this heavy pitfalls controversy with Ragnar Frisch. The first article, you see more than 50 pages, a leading article, never translated into English according to my knowledge, by Leontiev was an attempt on the statistical analysis on supply and demand. And there was a second article from 32, also published in the Kiel journal, Weltwirtschaftliches Archiv, with almost the same length, studies on the elasticity of supply. Uh, but it was the first article which caused a heavy, really very hostile attack by Ragnar Frisch against Leontiev's method. And the main issue where, Leontje, uh, where Frisch was very critical was that the method, more or less separation method for the uh, supply and the demand analysis, which was used by Leontiev. And this led, and you see published in English, but still in Germany at the beginning of 1933, by Ragnar Frisch. So the debate started, and Frisch definitely was the most important figure in the early years of the econometric society. Uh, unfortunately, Olaf Bjerkholt, who was a student of Frisch and did the most important work on the history of economic thought of uh, Frisch role, died very recently. And uh, so uh, interestingly, this German debate transferred across the Atlantic Ocean to the Harvard-based journal, Quarterly Journal of Economics. And you must know that uh, Leontiev moved with the beginning of the new academic year from uh, September 1932 from the Kiel Institute to New York, where for one year he had got a position at the National Bureau of Economic Research where Wesley Mitchell, who was professor at Columbia University, had become the founding director from 1920 to 1945. And in that period, the National Bureau was located in New York and only after the end of the war, it was shifted from New York to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where it is still located now. And the closest, the closest research associate of Wesley Mitchell at the NBER was Simon Kuznets, who himself had moved from Russia to the United States, but directly and not via Germany, indirectly, already in the early 1920s. And uh, Kuznets, who got the Nobel Prize two years before Leontiev in 71, already Leontiev in 73. 
and uh, so uh, Kastnet had close links with Adolf Lowe, also read the German text and wrote on this very favorably on what the Kiel group did in the late 1920s, early 1930s. And uh, the year after Leontief moved to the States was the new academic year in September 33, he got a position, his first three years contract as an assistant professor at Harvard. But in the Harvard-based journal, the heavy attack by Ragnar Frisch against Leontiev uh, continued. You see here, all in the quarterly journal, pitfalls in the construction of demand and supply curves, more pitfalls in demand and supply curve in that. So uh, a, a very heavy, I have to give you some flavor of that debate, a few words from this. It's a very, it's a methodological controversy which still has some modern equivalence, some very, very tricky uh, econometric problems on how you can separate or distinguish the elasticities on the supply and the demand side. The most important work, I think, uh, was done by John Chipman, who is still alive, but in the mid nineties now, who made a major work on this. This is by far the best article uh, to uh, symposium, which was organized by Olaf Bjerkold in memory of Ragnar Frisch and in honor of Ragnar Frisch uh, uh, on the contribution of Ragnar Frisch to economics and econometrics. And there uh, Chipman in greater detail refers to this pitfalls controversy and uh, defending partly also Leontiev against the attack by Frisch. But uh, the interesting thing is you probably know that Marshak in 43 became the director of the Coutts Commission in Chicago and uh, half of the later Nobel Prize winners between 43 and the mid 50s were at the Coutts Commission in Chicago like from Kenneth Arrow to uh, Gérard de Breu, and it was Frisch best student Truc de Havelmo, who in that period be developed the simultaneous equation approach in economics, which became one of the trademarks of the Counts Commission. And this was important for Frisch and partly uh, explains his hostile attack against uh, 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 Leontiev's method. I have no time to enter into the details, but you find uh, a lot on the PowerPoints, but let me just give you a flavor of the debate. In the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 1934, Ragnar Frisch ended his response to Leontiev's answer to his critique with the following statement. One cannot help feeling that the prestige of economics as a science must suffer when papers containing such mistakes and oversights as Dr. Leontiev's last paper appear in a journal of high international standing. So, uh, very difficult. And this explains also that two years later when discussions at Harvard took place, uh, whether to renew or not the contract of Leontiev as a young research assistant professor for a second period, was heavily endangered uh, because he was so much attacked. But Leontiev was not convinced by Frisch and he stated that Frisch only proves with the help of an elaborate numerical example that a quadratic equation has more than one solution. So besides Chipman, you have contributions by Lemus and others, uh, 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 still in modern econometrics and you can have a full uh, symposium or conference on the pitfalls debate between Frisch and Leontiev, who was right or who was wrong for what part, and you would enter into heavy controversies among modern econometricians. econometricians. So this is a quotation from Lima, but let me conclude with a final page. Uh, in one of the last papers of Paul Samuelson, where which was published in a book 
in memory of Leontia. Uh, there, Paul Samuelson refers to himself as a Leontiev boy, uh, like Solo also was, in a very favorable way. And uh, he mentions how good it was for Harvard that they had Leontiev as first assistant and associate and from the mid 40s full professor for more than four decades from 32 to 75. At, at the end of that period, he received a, a Nobel Prize. Uh, but Samuel refers to the fact, and I think he's right on this statement, in 2004, that Leontiev was only hired by Harvard due to Schumpeter pushing for the fact to hire Leontiev. And when the renewal of the contract for the second three-year period as an assistant professor was endangered because of the heavy attacks by Ragnar Frisch, then Schumpeter wrote a letter to the president of Harvard University in November 35, asking for the promotion of Leontia for a second term as assistant professor. Schumpeter wrote a similar letter to Keynes and Keynes responded positively, also supported this, where the only thing why Schumpeter is wrong is at the beginning, Leontia was already 24 and not 23, when he wrote this first 29 article, there, Schumpeter emphasized everybody read, discussed, criticized, admired, or damned it. The young Leontiev was in this field, in the center of discussion. Much may be said for and against the method itself, but no doubt is possible about the question relevant here, the supreme force and brilliance of the author as displayed by it. No similar case of similar success of so young a man is known to me either from experience or from the history of my science. So Schumpeter was successful in convincing the president of Harvard University and what happened thereafter you all know. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much Harold for this amazing presentation. Uh, are there any questions from our audience? Let me see. I don't see. Okay. Probably one of the questions I'd like to put to you. Uh, it looks like in the German period, Leontief was not pursuing this input output topic. So he mentioned it in his first article, but then somehow dropped it yeah. and dealt with other issues. It uh, began only in the US. Is, uh, am I right? Yes, you're completely right. Uh, uh, you may see, like Samuels wrote, the overture to his later ring of input output in his uh, Berlin PhD. And there was the very first page. I know there are some colleagues who are convinced that the first paper as an entry paper published in 1924-5 was, let me put it that way, was written with the support of his father. <laughs> which I, I'm convinced is true, but uh, you cannot uh, say that is definitely the case. And there are some influences among the Russian debate. You know that after Lenin started the new economic policy, you had a highbrow debate by Feldman and others in Russia, which then was more or less killed some years later by Stalin. But there was a leading project in the early 1960s in the United States with a lot of money which had been raised by FC Doma, who himself was also an emigre who originally came from the Russian Empire. So Doma knew about the importance of that work which took place in Russia, the Feldman model for example, and the work by Popov and uh, and there was a, a long time project and a major compilation of, in a book edited by Spalber, I think in 64 by uh, University of Indiana Press, where you have many translation into English of the leading articles from the Russian debate. And of course, 
Leontief and his father knew the early period, and particularly, I think, there is a stronger influence by Popov in the early period. But uh, after the Berlin PhD and in his Kiel years, and the year in China, uh, anyway, uh, Leontief did himself no work on input output. This started then only after he moved to the NBER in Harvard. Uh, I should add one other point. Uh, the relationship between Leontiev and Frisch very much improved later. And Frisch, as you know, was the first one who in 69, together with Tinbergen, got the Bank of Sweden Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. From the beginning, strongly suggested uh, Vasily Leontiev should receive the Nobel Prize. And in the 40s, he also was successful to uh, recommend uh, Leontiev to become president of the Econometric Society. So in an interview, uh, which in the early, uh, in the 1990s, shortly before his death, was made with Vasily Leontiev and his wife Estelle, uh, Leontiev only remembers, yes, there was a time where he had some differences with uh, Frisch, but the language is much more positive than the original language of the pitfalls controversy in the early 1930s. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Denis Melnik, please. Karl, you mentioned the time when the time when uh, Leningrad University, Institute of Social Science, to be more precise. I believe uh, his father also taught there uh, during that time. But I wonder, you mentioned, actually we saw that he mentions, uh, he mentioned, Leontief mentioned some professors of the Leningrad University. Uh, I wonder, did he make uh, any further references on the impact of his period, of his studies then, on his career, on his ideas, or it was just a kind of transitory stage in his uh, intellectual biography. You mean particularly the Kiel period? No, 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 the period when he studied at the Leningrad University. Okay, uh, I have to go to, this, uh, I think at the beginning. It's only here in the middle that he mentions the professors Kulischer, Platonov, yeah. Zonchev and Thale as his main teacher. So I think he was 16 years old in 21 when he started to study at, at that time, it was Petrograd, I think, University. And he got the diploma there in 25. And it was shortly before receiving the, uh, after receiving the diploma in uh, St. Petersburg that he moved to Berlin. But uh, there were some administrative or bureaucratic bottlenecks in Berlin that they did not immediately accept Leontiev as a PhD student, so he had to do two years of studies in Berlin, and he did it basically with Sombat Potkiewicz and this third professor who is less well known uh, today, where he took place in the seminars and got additional credits, so that uh, he was accepted as a PhD student in uh, 427. He submitted his PhD thesis, which he finalized at Kiel, where he was working since spring 27, already in uh, December 27 at, in Berlin, but uh, I think also for many administrative problems, it took a year until the oral exam took place on the 19th of December uh, 1928. But the thesis was submitted already a year before. Yes, we see that uh, Leontief enumerates famous historians among his teachers. Uh, uh, yeah. Tarle, yeah. Platonov, yes, and Kurischer, but not the e economists, th theoreticians. So this is... Uh, so this is uh, yeah. That's a German term, Lebenslauf, which means CV, basically. And the one, I have it from the University of Berlin, the page which was officially uh, submitted by Leontiev. 
Well, Solnsev was uh, a theoretician and even methodologist in a sense. Okay. So it can be added. <laughs> and partly historian of economic thought also. So he had such courses. I'm pretty sure since he was close to his parents that there was also very strong influence from his father. Who continued to yes. publish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Father, for, example, for example. Yes. The father, uh, when he was, uh, the father who was lecturing at the University of Berlin, uh, I think it's here, uh, over a period of almost 10 years, where the first half he was still officially working in, uh, on economic and social questions in the Russian embassy in Berlin. And then after 35, he was not at the embassy anymore, but still lived in, uh, in Berlin. He was writing longer articles, the leading uh, Russian journalists, where, for example, he was quite critical of uh, the outcome of the five years plan in the first half of the 1930s, for example. So understandable. Understandable. Yes. The yes. father definitely. The father definitely. Mm -hmm. I, th I think the father. I think the father. So, sorry, there's a seemingly a time delay in the connection. <laughs> Uh, I think the father, and he probably was right in having rational expectations, was convinced that going back to Russia, he would have the same fate as Kondratyev. <laughs> At least with the text. Yes, yes, that's pretty sure. Okay, I don't see any other questions or remarks. Well, let's then thank our wonderful speakers for today's presentation. I think we enjoyed it. And uh, well, let's work on this project uh, later. Uh, probably there will be some volume uh, we're preparing with Harald about Russian-Western uh, interrelations in economic thought. And uh, these presentations could be part of it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you once again.